All right, everybody, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we're gonna go into the collective power of Me Too, and I could speak a lot on this topic because sexual assault on college campuses and just sexual assault and um, rape prevention is what I, what my specialty is in. Um, so I'm going to try really hard to make this as brief as possible and really get into some of the main core points that I want you to get out of this piece. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the Me Too movement just broadly real quick. For those who don't know, I, um, the Me Too movement was started by Tarana Burke. Um, Tarana Burke uh, started the Me Too movement as an attempt to really show solidarity amongst women of color um, to kind of garner this drive for more resources or better resources um, for this group of women um, as they sought any kind of again, any kind of resources, whether it be justice oriented, whether it be, um, whether it be self-preservation oriented, whether it be community-based help, any, any of these things. Um, and they started this movement and around the time of the Harvey Weinstein case really started picking up steam and allegations and things. Um, we had several actresses who um, came forward and drew on some ideas from the Me Too movement and pushed those into a more centralized focus, which then spread to social media, which we all know what happens when that happens, right? So social media then took over this idea that Alyssa Milano had kind of um, sparked this Me Too movement where women essentially would be talking about whether or not they had also experienced sexual assault in the workplace, um, sexual harassment, sexual violence, um, just to kind of get a positionality on how frequent this was as a visual, right? Um, and so what happened was this sparked a massive conversation broad, more broadly in our more broad society because of just the overarching um, really large numbers of women took place in, in, in speaking up in hashtag me too. And really it was just about centering hashtag me too. It wasn't about necessarily giving specifics or having to tell stories, um, though that happened as well as part of this. Um, and hashtag me too then sparked into several other hashtags and several other conversations. Um, but knowing that this again was originated um, by Tarana Burke, Tarana, ah, sorry, Tarana Burke as an, a concept to really emphasize um, solidarity amongst Black women. And it sparked a really huge conversation more broadly due to a bunch of white actresses. There's some, there's some things that got lost in the messaging of that movement. However, the movement itself did spark a lot of very good and interesting conversations. Um, something I do want to draw your attention to is this link I have put down at the bottom of the screen that is the Tarana Burke TED Talk um, where she talks about how um, the movement still has more to come. It still has more to do um, and that and really spoke after after this moment in history where social media kind of took it and ran with it, right? Um, and so I think, I think it is a good and worthy of your time and energy to listen to this TED Talk. Um, there's also several other interviews you can find on YouTube or what have you that are equally um, is beneficial with her talking about really where we can go from here. Um, and I think that that's worth mentioning. Um, so again, the Harvey Weinstein case really was where this became a little bit different and something different um, and talking to, and, and what it did was spark these, these, again, these conversations of how frequent this was because of so many women, again, essentially raising their hand and saying, hey, me too. Hey, um, these things have happened to me as well. And really um, the men on social media and just everyone really engaging in that moment where um, 
their their feeds were over flooded with me too's hashtag me too's hashtag me too um by numer by the women in their worlds right um and so this really garnered conversations again not just about these particular cases that were very big and prominent in hollywood but also funneling down to more um fundamental conversations about the frequency of harm done to women how the system is not are not geared toward gear, geared towards or effective in um allocating resources or justice to women who these things have been done to um and really talking about how 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 many things need to change right um i will draw on the fact that again where she really originated this was to create and establish better resources um it ended up becoming sort of this celebrity list of names of men who were a inappropriately acting, which again served its own purpose. It created another thing in a whisper network called the shitty men and media men's list so that there was these, um, that was constantly updated so that people within that industry um, could tap into those things. Other other lists also happened and, and there became this network of networking amongst women to kind of warn slash hold conversations um, of solidarity when situations occurred or, hey, this isn't just me. This has also happened by this person from multitudes of people. Um, it's marked other ideas on even college campuses where there have become websites to um, kind of filter through or talk through, hey, this person or this in this situation, this has happened to me. Has this happened to anybody else in the in the areas? And that, and that hasn't happened everywhere, but it's allowed this kind of whisper network amongst women and marginalized communities to have conversations about safety and security within within um, the places and spaces that they operate. Um, it did create, again, several conversations later, started to have um, more survivor-led conversations about protecting survivors, right? So um, it, it, it gave a seat at the table to again, have women get to speak on and speak for um, the things that have they've experienced and the, and the traumas that they've experienced. And I think that if nothing else, the Me Too movement gave opportunity to have these survivor-led um, panels and groups. And um, there in Kentucky, it, they created the um, Survivors Council under the attorney, under Andy Brashear when he was the attorney general. Um, I was part of the second group of women, the second council within that group. Um, and I think they just had the third ones back in January of this year. So it allowed this ability to create platforms and situations and groups that would consistently be able to go out and make change in various ways, right? And I think that that was very important. Um, it also talked about the resistance to this patriarchal power as inherent um, to women's bodies. So talking about this idea that just because um, I am part of the patriarchal system does not give and garner men access to me. And that is a big deal, right? That is a big big conversation and a big piece because so much of patriarchal ideologies and hierarchies are built on these power dynamics that create and obscure um, human autonomy, okay? Um, I think, again, one of the biggest problems that it highlighted, um, this movement highlighted, was really that there are no real options for justice that our justice systems, the options that are there are flooded with um, inconsistencies. They're flooded with trauma moments where survivors are not believed or their, their cases are not taken on or what have you, um, that it takes an overwhelming amount of effort um, and rehashing of your trauma narratives constantly 
um, in order to create even space for that to be a possibility. And past that, looking into like transformative and restorative justice patterns or community-based justice patterns where um, maybe at a community level, there are, are, are less judicial housed, <laughs> like judicially housed um, conversations about, about healing. Um, between the victim and the perpetrator or, or what have you amongst community members. The problem here became that almost all of these center, the community center, justice center, even the perpetrator in some cases, not a lot of them consistently center the survivor. Not a lot of them consistently center the woman in this case, um, when we're talking about violence against women. And that was highlighted overwhelmingly. Um, it was overwhelmingly continued conversation of re-traumatization in the process of seeking justice. Um, and, and really now having to look and really as academics, as activists, as leaders, as women, about the ways in which we really want to change those things, about the ways in which we want to create justice for this through powerful mechanisms of healing. And I don't necessarily think we've exactly found those answers just yet. Um, but again, also when we're talking about justice, also talking about the marginalizations that consistently also happen within the justice system is important. So talking about how, um, how men of color are more likely to seek um, more harsh penalties for these things, um, but black women are less likely to be believed. Uh, talking about how, how, um, again, just talking about the different ways in which marginalization creates that justice, that divide within that even desire to be part of that justice system um, because of the ways in which several other marginaliz like marginalizations one might carry will create more barriers to seeking justice in that way. Um, so it also talked about a very different levels of power within workplaces. So it also just talked about at the core level, when we're sitting in a workplace situation, do we have, as women, equal amounts of power, space, autonomy, um, believability, where, where, what are these power dynamics that are consistently and continuously part of the equation at work and why are they there? And having these conversations has led to, again, more pushes for pay equality, more pushes for difference in who gets to be leaders in these companies, in these big companies, who gets to make decision-making about policies and really having more in-depth conversations surrounding workplace power dynamics. Um, they talk a little bit at the end of this article really about reparations and talking about the idea of some of these women being paid for the harms that were done to them through, through multitudes of different um, sexual harassment and so sexual allegation charges. And talking about how we talk a lot about women being paid off or being in the justice system um, should should be kind of this like dynamic where well if the person got time or got some kind of penalty then that should be enough for the woman um and that taking money like is is a negative thing right like that that's you're just selling out or whatever or you're just doing this but in in cases when it came to these workplace injustices where this created situations where these women were, were, did not have access to maybe possible jobs or maybe possible promotions or maybe um, led them to not get the, the, the bonus that year or led them to not get to lead the team that got to drive this specific selling point or what have you, that that had like tangible real life economic outcomes. And so having an economic solution should be part of that equation. Um, and really having a different conversation surrounding what reparations really need to be there and how um, some of these harms, especially in workplace outcomes, can have very big economic impacts. Um, and then just even outside of that, the economic impact of being a trauma survivor when it comes to 
physical health screenings when it comes to um, any kind of um, physical harm or emotional or mental harm that may come out of that. And the treatment for those things are not, are not zero, right? They don't cost zero dollars. So um, making sure that we understand that when, when we are having conversations about being paid or having money come out of any kind of justice outcome, that that should be up to and completely at the adherence of the decision of of the person who experienced these harms and that societally we need to have more conversations about the cost, the like tangible cost of being a survivor. Um, uh, lastly, I just kind of want to touch on some of the other, um, in the same way that we talk about the collective power of Me Too, we could talk about the collective power of several other um, things that came up around that time or af shortly after or even some before. Um, so we're talking about things like uh, hashtag times up. So talking about this ideology that, okay, now we're, okay, we've expressed that this has happened. Now where's the change, right? Like, so here's your time's up. We need change now. And so really having conversations surrounding that, like, acknowledgement piece has to turn into policy piece, right? Hashtag say her name, um, where we we're having a, um, a very large conversation about police brutality and, and the injustices in the justice department. We were not really having really tangible conversations about the women of color that were also um, negatively impacted or harmed very severely in, and some of them even lost their lives um, when it came to police brutality elsewhere. So making sure that, again, when we're having these conversations, we're having full conversations that are including including women, including the dynamics we need to have. Um, so the, uh, the missing Indigenous women movement really talking about um, how many, how often Indigenous women go missing and how little attention their cases get. Um, and also just the murders um, of Indigenous women and how often that um, that statistical probability is for that population and really having co coherent conversations about the structural injustice that Im impacts all of those things. Um, and then hashtag I am I next, um, again, having those conversations about um, multiple marginalizations for women and marginal, um, how those marginal, mar marginal <laughs> marginalizations um, really impact the likelihood of violence. And so really um, just thinking through there, there are a multitude of others. Um, there are trans Black Lives Matter as well. There are um, a multitude of other um, things that came out of really some of these movement ideas and some of these calls to change. And so really as you see new hashtags or things like this, really picking up and sitting with self um, how these may impact me, how they imply, how they apply to me, and even if they don't, how they might, how they are likely to apply to somebody that I care about or um, uh, in ways that I may not even understand. So um, yeah, that's all I have for this one. And I will talk to you again soon. I hope you have a great day. Again, take care of yourself because some of these readings this week are a little, um, can hit on very, um, hard topics and can get a hit on topics that really resonate to our own personal experiences in ways that can be harmful. So I want to make sure that we're all taking care of ourselves, especially this week and um, are these two weeks um, and moving into some of the documentaries as well. All right. Have a good day.